patients and great varieties that friends gives us the whole idea of terroir and how um yeah we're being recorded now. okay well i am I want to make sure you're yes. recorded. I don't want to... um, all the major grape varieties that we find around the world and the wine business in general. And what a great end it was last week with champagne, where we understood like how really wine marketing and business works in the high end world of wine. Now, Italy is number two, and we're going to be spending three weeks, which is also a substantial time in Italy. And why do you think that is? Well, um, I'll give you the answer. How about that? Um, about a few years ago, Italy surpassed France in volume of wine production. Um, so it is currently the largest producer of wine in the world. It'll soon be overtaken by Spain, but for now it's still Italy. But more importantly, for us here in the United States, Italian wines are the number one imported wines worldwide. So we import more wines from Italy than say from France or from Argentina or Australia or any of these places. Um, so in the United States, in our wine business, Italy is, has actually in a way surpassed France. Um, and as you probably realize that a lot of the wines and grape varieties that are really popular right now, Prosecco, Pinot Grigio, Moscato, and all this, it's all Italian. There's a great documentary, Mondo Vino, which is a little dated now, it was done in 2004, but still a lot of the stuff that you'll see there, and it's about the wine world in general, from tiny little producers in Sardinia to gigantic houses, uh, to importers and like every facet of the business you'll get to see uh some of the the um the flying um winemakers like michelle Rolland is in that movie um so you a lot of the stuff like you know that still means a lot to us today um is in there one of the things that stuck with me is that james suckling who at that time was still a wine writer for the wine spectator was quoted. And he's probably, hey TJ, how about it? I saved the front seat here for you. Um, he said, and he's probably, I would guess he's my age. So when, you know, he said it was 2004, so we were all a little younger. Um, but he said something about Italian wine. And he, after he left the wine sp spectator, kind of became what Robert Parker is for French wines, for Italian wine. So he, you know, his word counts a lot, has some weight to it. He said that his parents' generation in the United States, for his parents' generation, fine dining and fine wine was synonymous with French. You go look some classic, American movies from the 1970s. And it's all, you know, if they want to go out to watch French Direct uh, uh, Connection or even Jaws, any of these classics, when they do, when they drink wine or when they eat, it's French. And he said, my generation in New York, it's all Italian. And it's not like the American Italian version of it, it's the Italian Italian version. Of it. So all of a sudden, and I remember you know, I moved in 1989, seeing in the early 90s how that changed. Like all of a sudden you would get fine dining places and they would be more and more Italian. So with that came fine wine and for, and for importers also, the desire to import fine wine from Italy. So that's why we are here right now and we're doing Italy next. Now, um, obviously, Okay, I got it. Thank you. Um, obviously, this, what we talked about, you know, for five weeks straight about France will still apply. We still have that concept of terroir, of wine representing a place where it's from. Now, it's in the Italian language instead of the French language. So we'll go, you know, we'll talk a lot about this when we talk about um, the different wine regions. Let us look at Italy. So what I'm going to do is, so you have an idea. 
We're going to look at the whole country first, look at some important geographical things, because as we know, and as we learned from France, that matters. So we're going to look at that first, so we have an idea where we are. Um, and then we're going to go, of course, always my favorite part, the wine laws and labels. We're going to learn how to read an Italian wine label, what important words on an Italian wine label mean, so that you, when you go into a wine shop and pick up a bottle, at least have an idea of what this could be, right? Um, after we're done with all of that, the Italian wine regulations, which that's going to be fun. Um, it's a place of anarchy often. Yeah. So um, after we're done, we're going to start today exploring, or for you guys um, online, we're going to be exploring the south of Italy and it's in the big islands of Sicily and Sardinia. And then next week, we're going to do the middle part centered around Tuscany, of course, you know, one of the two most important areas, like the Bur Burgundy and Bordeaux of Italy are Tuscany and Piedmont. So next week it's going to be here, and then we'll finish off in Northern Italy um, with Piedmont and the great Barolos and Barbarescos and that kind of stuff, All right? So that's the plan. Let's look at Italy. And when, so, first of all, this year, these 20, what they call in Italy, regions, all of these here for you guys online, are what we call states. So in the United States, we have 50 states. In Italy, we have 20 regions. Look at this. You know what that means? You know what makes Italy unique in that regard? There is wine made in every single one of these 20 regions. Remember the France map? There were large areas that were completely blank because actually most of France does not grow grapes for wine, fine wine production. Okay, that's very different in Italy. You know, why is that? Good question. Well, A, we have, so France is here, right? So what part of France borders Italy? Laura, please. Provence. Provence, yes. We have Provence here. Rhone, Languedoc, Roussillon. So basically, northern Italy to central Italy is where southern France is, right? So that means this whole part is actually south of that. It's this is in its entirety here, really. Mediterranean, warm to hot Mediterranean climate, ample sunshine, ripeness in grapes, not a problem, not in that country, right? So you have ideal growing conditions. Next, we have two important mountain ranges. Number one, for you guys on the, online, it's here. Can you see that too? Oh, yeah, you can. Um, the Alps. Turn that off. That's the Alps. Um, the Alps are a gigantic mountain range that protects Italy because, see, curves around here. It protects Italy from the cold and crummy weather that I grew up with, you know, up there. Um, and you, it's really interesting. Actually, you can drive. There's a tunnel in Switzerland where you can drive 70 kilometer long tunnel. One lane going this way, one that way. Um, you know, you usually enter in the north and it's like, you know, 53 degrees and drizzling rain, and you come out here and it's like 68 and sunshine. You know? So uh, that really helps having the Alps. Plus, it's not just the Alps, as we will see when we get in two weeks to northern Italy, but it has these rolling hills just leading up to the Alps, which again generate ideal growing conditions for grapes, perfect elevation and pitch. The second, Almost more important mountain range and less known here in the United States are the, is the Apennines or Apennino in Italian. And it goes, follow the cursor here from here. It's basically from the border of France. It separates Liguria and Piedmont and then turns south and ran, runs as I think Jancis Robinson writes in our book. It's like the spine that runs the length of Italy. It runs all the way, and you can see where those white areas are. It's just too high to grow grapes. All the way down here, all the way to here. 
and virtu basically splits Italy into two, in the eastern and in the, in the, in the western half. Um, and of course, it's not just, it doesn't go up like this. It's a mountain range, so it has hills and, 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 and uh, you know, rolling hills and smaller mountains before you get to the higher ends. Again, creating, and I'm going to quote it because it's so beautifully uh, formulated from our book, that spine that runs the length of Italy creates every desirable combination of elevation, yeah, how high we're growing our grapes, latitude, right here, and exposure, which way the vineyards are angled. And that, and the fact that in Italy, we're dealing with, depending on which book you read, but let's say, which is pretty much right, about a thousand indigenous grape varieties means that arguably there is no other country in the world that is more diverse when it comes to wine. So that's pretty cool. However, when you study Italian wines, what that means is we're going to be running into a lot of different grape varieties. We are out of France. It's not just you know, 20, it's like we're dealing, just today alone, the, the amount of grape varieties you're gonna be hearing is gonna be overwhelming. The most difficult thing about Italian wines is next, is it? No, it's not next. The most difficult thing about Italian wines is like there is so much out there. There are so many different grape varieties and the labeling of Italian wine doesn't really help us. So we just need to study. You need to study what's a place name. You need to study what's a grape name, okay? But I will help you with that. Okay. Um, oh, and one more thing, and that's also very important that adds to the diversity of Italian wines is that we have, of course, who brought viticulture, vinification, winemaking in general to the rest of Europe. The Romans, the Romans, they, the Greeks brought it here a little bit. Yeah, but they all, the part of Italy that we're visiting today already had great growth. Even it is said 5,000 years ago, Phoenicians noticed like they have some sort of wine trade going on there. No, the Romans, Rome right here, right? When they had their empire, they conquered everybody. And they brought winemaking with them. So we look, we saw that in Provence, we heard about that in the Burgundy class. Yeah. You guys who were here for the longer doc uh, for the Sud de France event heard how they went along the Mediterranean and brought winemaking to that part of town. Can you close the window for me, please? It's difficult. No, sorry. Um, way before it went to Bordeaux or other places up north. Um, all the far, all the way up to Germany, to Austria, to Hungary, Great Britain. They brought grape growing and winemaking to Great Britain. So everywhere. They were. All right. So uh, now I lost my point. Why I don't think. Ah. Um, anyway, it was them that started all of that. So we have this enormous history in Italy. So we have also a lot of traditional winemaking. And then on top of that, very modern mind making, because one thing happens, like you may ask yourself, it's like, how come if the Romans did all this, like already very elaborate, uh, you know, they had this knowledge of our grape growing and winemaking, you know, why didn't we hear about Italian wines until like way after World War II? Reason is middle ages, you know, it's like this country, which wasn't a country until 1861, really, in our modern sense, kind of like put its head in the sand, took a beauty sleep for 500 years, woke up, you know, uh, during the Renaissance area for a little while. We'll get to that when we talk about Chianti. But then really nothing happened until after World War II. And when they looked at France and they realized, like, what the hell are we doing here? We got to do better. That's when they said, we're going to have to copy the French AOC system. And that, my friends, are my pyramids here. You know how much I love them. So they said, we're going to copy that system. We're going to make an appellation system. But because in, Fran in Italy, we speak Italian and not French, we're not going to call it appellation d'origine contrôlée, but we call it 
DOC. Denominazione d'originata controllata. So, in Italian, the word for appellation is denomination, which I kind of like better because it really just, it means we gave it a name. So DOC means we gave it a name of controlled origin. So, same as in France, where we know Sancerre is the name of a place, not the grape. In Italian, that would be Chianti. That's a place. We gave it that name and we control its origin, meaning we draw a line around it and say, this is, if you're from within there, you can call yourself Chianti. You can only grow this grape. You can only make it this way. You can make only that much wine per vineyard and so on and so forth. Same as in France, just here it's called DOC, right? So that's the top. I'll get to this in a second. So this here is the, the top of the pyramid, the top quality wines. Under it, like in France, we have IGT or IGP. What used to be Verne de Pay in France, but now is IGP in France as well. P again meaning so it's easier with um, French and Italian as an English speaker to just read it backwards. It's a typical geographic indication, TGI in cinema, or protected geographic indication. Again, as I said, in the EU, we decided at some point we like the word protected better than controlled because it's nicer, and it is. Um, so that's that level under it. Looser, also geographic, so it's also delineated, but much bigger and much looser rules. And then under it, these are the areas that we really are not going to get into at all. It's the, the, the really cheap supermarket stuff, which was called table wine, vino da tavola, vin de table, but now just if it's from Italy, vino d'Italia, if it's from France, vin de France. So yeah, we'll forget about that. All right. In France, we learned that some wineries name their wine AOC and some AOP. And again, it's the P substituting the C, but only in that it means the same thing, protected versus control. So in the whole EU, and that is that regulation since 2008, that not only applies to wine, I told you that before, but other products like cheese or sausages or pasta that it, you know, you can only use a certain name for Parmigiano Reggiano if it's actually from Parma. Yeah, so that's this pyramid here with DOP on the top. In Italy, in 1966, they decided, okay, so we are going to start with the DOC system. But historically, we had these areas, they were always more famous. So we should maybe give some people a higher ranking. And that's what that G is. That stands for guaranteed. So DOCG of, you know, a denomination of controlled and guaranteed <coughs> origin. Does it uh, have any stipulations on the quality of that wine? No, unfortunately not. What it means is it has some like really very, very political uh, reasons. So they gave six DOCs that extra G. You know, they gave it to Chianti and Chianti Classico. We'll talk plenty next week about that. Brunello di Montalcino, Vino Nobile di Montepulciano, Barolo, and Barbaresco in Piedmont. So four in Tuscany, two in Piedmont as like the top. And just to honor that they for so long had made the best wines in Italy. Again, to add that G, because that was then. We started with six. I have numbers here. And this is the part where Italy becomes um, ridiculous. To anybody who is in the wine business, who writes wine books, who is passionately in love with Italian wines, it drives us nuts how these DOCG laws are applied. Um, again, uh, I can give you a few examples here because it is like, so whereas DOC is heavily regulated to get that extra G, which means basically you, if you get it, can charge more for your wine. Hmm? So um, the 
to get promoted, basically you have your wine region has to have historical importance. Where don't you have that in Italy? Uh, it has to have international recognition, again, pretty shady. Uh, improved tremendously and attracted social attention. No idea what that means. And contributed substantially to Italy's financial health. So if you come up with something that fits in these categories, you can get your G. You know what? When I started teaching this class in 2010, we had, I still see that number here somewhere, I think 27, which already went up from the original six, right? And then within something like five years, it jumped from 27 to 74. It's in your handout, the number, but don't, we're not gonna ask you those on the test because they change and it's not fair, but just as an idea. So for let's say the first 40 years, it went from six to 27. And then within five years, it went from seven to 74. I mean, there's some, you know, great, great wines from Italy, like Amarone, which only then became a DOCG. They've been making great wines for, you know, hundreds of years. At the same time, they're giving three zones right here in northern Apulia, which is not known for fine wine, also a DOCG. So that must have been really uh, infuriating to people that were waiting for this for such a long time. So in a nutshell, DOCG does unfortunately not always mean that this, these are better wines. It usually means you can charge more money for it. However, there are, and in particular, when we go to those original six, there are some, those are the classic Italian wines. Secondly, and we're going to be running into this a lot this week uh, with Southern Italy, they completely shunned Southern Italy. Anyone who knows something about Italy is like there is a giant, gigantic rift between the North and the South. And the North is the economic powerhouse of Italy that have for a very, very long time looked down on the South. The South was poor, but it's exciting. Or as Berlin's former mayor said, Berlin is poor, but sexy. And it is in Southern Italy. We'll see a lot of values and a lot of cool wine making. But we'll get to that in a second. So, all right. Now we know that. What we're going to do is this. Every time we zoom into one of the regions, I'm going to tell you, and that's exactly what the handout does for you. It's going to tell you what the important DOCs slash DOCGs are that you need to know, because there are now, all in all, DOC, DOCGs, about 408. And I don't think anybody knows all of them by heart, and I will not expect you to do the same. But you need to be able, if I tell you Campania, you got to come on with a few, a couple, you know, especially the more. And we will, as we get to that, I'll tell you what the important regions are and what the lesser important regions are. Okay. So that's that. Questions on that? Do we have any uh, questions from you people here? Nope. Um, it's. Pretty straightforward so far, except with that G, DOC G rule, yeah? Um, all right, cool. How do we read an Italian wine label? How are Italian wines labeled? We know from France, with few exceptions, and these exceptions being mostly wines from Alsace, what do we do in France? We name the wine after the place, right? In Alsace, we have a rider label. We name it after the grape variety. In Italy, we have three, basically we have three different ways of naming a wine. Number one, the place. Chianti, Barolo, Barbaresco. Those are all places. Those are not grape varieties. How do I know when I look at the bottle? You don't, you have to learn that. So that's, that's that. A lot of the older, more traditional wines have place names instead of names of grape varieties. 
You can have just a grape variety. It could just say Pinot Grigio, and then it's from uh, Trentino or from Friuli. Or you can have what is more common, a combination of grape and place name. In that particular case, and that is a pretty fantastic wine, uh, this is, the wine is called Montepulciano d'Abruzzo, D apostrophe, yeah? That D is short for D-I or D-E-L, depending on the, you know, the grammar of the word. Means from, hint here, whatever comes before the D is the grape variety and whatever comes after the D is the place because it says Montepulciano from Abruzzo. There's a wine that I already mentioned that is called Vino Nobile di Montepulciano. That is a wine, that's a Montepulciano, that's from the town of Montepulciano. Guess what they don't grow there? Montepulciano. So they call their wine the noble wine of Montepulciano, which is mostly Sangiovese, it's in Tuscany. But in order to not confuse those two, they both have Montepulciano in there. One is before the D, that's the great Montepulciano from Abruzzo. We're going to have one next week. And the other one is egg wine from the town of Montepulciano. Okay. So remember, like, this is a, a really good hint or tip to identify Italian wine labels if you just know this is what it means. D means from, whether it's apostrophe. D apostrophe or D I or D E L or D E L L E, all these words, you know, that are in between those, they mean from. And then you look what's before and then we look what's after, and you should be pretty good. Okay, so that's that. <clears throat> the third wine, let me just show this to you a little better here. This is called Guidalberto. And as you can see here, these are um, DOC wines, right? Denominational DOCG wine. This is a DOCG, this is a DOC. This is just an IGT from the larger Toscana region. And it has what we call a generic name, a made up name. Something the winemaker said, I'm just gonna call my wine say Opus One or Prisoner or you know, silver oak or what we are all so familiar with in the United States. The Italians do the same thing. Again, you just have to learn. When you see those labels, it'll not tell you, oh, this is a generic name, or this is great variety first, and then, or this is just a base name. We don't get to have that privilege. Same as, you know, usually, or in the old days, it was in France. They just tell you, that's the appellation. You got to know what's in it. Okay. But those are the three different types. Every time we run into a wine like that, I will tell you what it is. And if you ever have a question, please, that's what I'm here for. You ask, what is this now? Because this is important. Uh, we're going to be talking about this a lot um, next week because there's a whole very exciting category uh, on Tuscany, the so-called super Tuscans, which all rely on this. And once you get it, when they choose generic names, you know what? They just threw tradition out the window. Then this is such a, for you, you already know them. It's like, okay, they're gonna be doing things differently. They're gonna be using different grape varieties. They're not gonna be giving, you know, any thought of what traditional winemaking there did by just knowing, oh, this is a you know, generic name. Okay. Questions? No? Is that all too intimidating or are you just really fascinated listening? Fascinated. Thank you, Christine. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, Very yes. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, and of course, this is so great to explain Hey, look where the D is. You know, in the old days, everything was like Sagrantino di Montefalco. It's like, yay, it's a Sagrantino grape from Montefalco. You know what they call it now? 
Montefalco Sagrantino as just to mess with us. <laughs> they take it out and then you flip it around and then we'll go like, oh my God, now I got to learn this again. You know, but it's all the way around. All right, cool. So let me just see if I forgot anything here regarding the introduction. I don't think so. Oh, no, no, no. One more thing. And if that's on your handout, because that has something to do with um, labeling. Um, see this word classical? Every time you see that on an Italian wine label, that means it's from the original DOC or the heartland of the DOC, from the core of the DOC. Very important when we go to Chianti and Chianti Classico, because then we'll see actually, oh yeah, that's easy to understand. Chianti Classico sits, is the core and Chianti is surrounding it, all right? So Classico means from the original heartland. We have times, terms like Reserva. We know these terms also from Reserve, from California wines or from Chilean wines or Argentinian wines. You know what they mean there? They're aged. No, they mean nothing. They mean I can ask for more money. Uh, or the yeah. winemaker thinks, this is my best wine. I'm going to call it a reserve. There is no regulation. In Italy, in Austria, in Spain, uh, in Portugal, everywhere where you use that word in the EU, it means something. That means it's aged longer. You know, And then depending on who makes the, the rules, like the, the, the DOC or DOCG for each wine will tell you, well, if it's a Barbera and you want to call it Barbera, a Reserva, then it has to age half a year longer. And then there's a world called Superiore or Superior. That also has to have, um, you know, certain regulations followed. So if you have one wine and then you have another wine that's a superior, it has to have usually higher alcohol content. It also has to come from the better vineyards that's established. So in Italy, when you see these words on the label, they actually mean something, okay? All right, and now we can dive into <clears throat> the south of Italy. Now, um, In France, the South was called Midi. Yeah? And in Italy, it was called, it was referred to as the Mezzogiorno. And as I said before, the people that referred to Southern Italy as the Mezzogiorno did not mean that particularly nice. They looked down upon that part. This is all down here that has ancient history. I mean, literally like 2,500 years ago, people growing wine there and trading wine. Yeah? But it had been poor for a long time um, and there had not been any investment made. And that had not really changed until, um, until the EU started building up, same as in the Languedoc-Roussillon region in France, in, in these like, um, uh, poorer rural areas to, um, uh, to invest money and help people. And once that, that was done, this whole area turned into something that's really, really fascinating. So think of it like this. Up until about 20 years ago, they were making all the mistakes that you make in these areas where you don't have enough money. You think it's like, maybe if I grow more grapes, then I have more to sell, you know? But then they are not going to be the quality um, that can give you a lot of money. So, but they didn't have the money to make the investment to buy modern winery equipment um, or sometimes old winery equipment like amphoras and stuff like that, which is all expensive. So um, what they suffered from was the economies were, were, were awful. Um, but that fortunately has changed. And now that part of Italy like the Languedoc, <coughs> Brussillon area in France is one of these areas where you, there's real excitement because you can still, like the most, <coughs> probably like the, the hottest space in the European wine world right now, place is Mount Etna in, uh, in Sicily. And not just because, you know, it's an active volcano hot, but because everybody wants to have vineyards there. 
because it's you cannot get that quality level of vineyard anywhere else until unless you're a millionaire you know and there you can still get these things probably not like since yesterday not anymore but you know you know what i mean so uh, this is what's happening there. so with that you have exciting younger winemakers getting a chance to do something to try something new you have people that were going to hear their names of that did fantastic a fantastic job in saving grape varieties that would otherwise have dis, uh, disappeared completely in those areas down here. Um, so let's do a little overview. What do we have here? So the four southern states, let me call it that way because it's easier, are Campania, um, Calabria, Puglia, and then there's Basilicata in here. And then we usually bunch that together with, although we grow completely different grape varieties here, Sicily and Sardinia. So those are the areas that we're going to be visiting. And we're going to make our first stop. And on this slide, again, you're going to be getting the slide. We already indicated here. These are the major grape varieties you're going to be finding. So it's all on here. So Campania, uh, the, the, the black grape bunch indicates, uh, you know, the, the grape varieties here. So we have Alianico, Fiano, Falangina, Greco. And so for each one of these, you will have that listed here. Um, in Basilicata, and, you know, let's go. Sorry about that, but I do want to go back to the map here. Look where it is. This is interior Italy. There is very, very little wine made in Basilicata. You think of it, this is all rugged mountains. I was down here in Calabria visiting a winemaker. And you know Calabria, if you look at the ocean, you know what the next stop is? It's North Africa. That's how far south you are. I was visiting a winery because we import their wines and it is so elegant and I could never get it. It's like, cause I had, it's like, this is gonna be so hot down there. But you, elevation, like I said here, is the key in Southern Italy. Everything is mountainous and rugged with one area and that's the, the heel of the boot here, um, the Southern tip of Puglia, which is flat and hot. And there you have a little bit of that air conditioning effect because you have two seas on each side. One thing I didn't bring up, but you know, obviously it's a peninsula, so it's surrounded by water on three sides, uh, all the Mediterranean with different names. We're going to get into those. So this is the Ionian Sea down here, Tyrrhenian Sea here, Adriatic Sea here. All right. So rugged mountains, imagine that mountainous, hilly. Elevation is the key. That's why you can get real elegance in these wines. Now, and if when I say rugged, Basilicata is really, really rugged to a point where there's very little grown there. There's one important wine in Basilicata, and that is Alianico del Vulture. So, can somebody tell me what the grape is? Alianico, yes, you can speak up. Confidence? Alianico, exactly. And where is it from? Yeah, but when you see that word here, Vultere, which is an extinct volcano. That's the other thing. Italy had, especially in the south, a lot of volcanoes. We know Mount Etna, an active volcano. Vesuvio, where Pompeii is, an extinct volcano. Vultere, also a volcano. So we have a lot of, we're dealing with a lot of volcanic soil. So a lot of minerality in these wines. Um, so Basilicata, what you need to know about Basilicata is one thing. They grow this great grape variety, Alianico, which I'll talk about in a second, and we're going to be tasting one later. Um, so Alianico, when it's from Campania, from a place called Taurasi, was always called the Barolo of the South. And Alianico del, del Vulture is the Barbaresco of the South. Yeah. So those are wines that have... Although they're from the South and um, usually even, even 20 years ago, <clears throat> these areas were able to produce wines with great ageability, much more so than the rest of the South. So that's, 
that's here. There is a little Malvasia, which is a grape variety you run into a lot in the South Malvasia uh, grown. We'll talk about that more next week as well, explain that a little more. Um, all right, but let's go to Campania because this is really, <coughs> when we come to uh, Southern Italy's mainland, the most exciting place. Campania is the region or state around Naples. Okay. Um, it was during Roman times, their favorite spot for white wines. Although Campania is so far south, about 60% of the wines made there are white and only 40% red. Um, like I said, so an ancient history of the Romans 2000 years ago liking these wines. And I like everything else down there, it, it dropped off. And a lot of these white wine varieties had been lost if it hadn't been for the intervention of really courageous um, and excited winemakers uh, that started around 1980. Um, Mastro Berardino is one of the names. You'll have that name on the handout. It's probably the most important name uh, in, uh, in Campania who saved Fiano, the grape variety, the white wine variety from extinction and who created the DOCG Taurasi, which we're gonna be taking the Barolo of the South. So hugely important. Um, so you'll see you have some coastal areas um, where they grow great, where they make wine, which is great. A lot of the white wines, the beauty with Italy, Italian wines is, and as we taste them, we'll get this too, is like, they are very much old world wines. They require food because you know what Italians do when they eat? They drink wine. And what do they do when they drink wine? They eat, it comes together. So Italian wines in particular go really well with food. And you can see there's a lot of white wine growing here. This is a gigantic sea. You know what you eat a lot in Italy and especially in Southern Italy? Fish, tons of it. So these things go really well with, with seafood dishes. The most important and the most exciting area in all of Campania is up here between the town of Avellino and Benevento, and then maybe just a little further north. This area here, which is for Fiano di Avellino, right? So Fiano from Avellino, Fiano is the grape from uh, Italian, of a piano, a bee, bees like to swarm around those trees. Um, and then here you have your Taurasi red wine, Alianico. So the best white and the best red border each other. And why is that? Why are they there? Because it's hills. These are the Irpinian hills. It's got perfect elevation. Um, imagine this, like there is a, we say like the drop rate for temperatures, of course, obviously the higher we go up, the cooler it gets, right? We, that, we all know that. So but it's about like you go up a thousand feet and the average temperature drops by three and a half degrees Fahrenheit. So it's got that sweet spot. It's got a lot of volcanic soil. Um, Vesuvio is right around there. Uh, Pompeii, that's all right there. So that's why these areas um, are so fantastic for grape growing and wine production. And again, now that we do have investment, not just from people receiving money from Brussels, from the EU, to rip out uh, you know, lesser uh, grape varieties and, and growing more noble grape varieties, you'll be able to reduce what your vineyard produces to make more quality wine. You are able to buy equipment, winery equipment, that can now make really clean and good wines, and they've all been doing this. And since then, we've seen um, a huge, um, rise in wines here in this country too, uh, that we import wines from Campania. Now, the most important, uh, so I mentioned this before, a lot of volcanic soil that we get here. Um, the most important appellation is Taurasi. That's a place name, write that down, because that's, you know, people love putting that in quizzes and some exams. What's the grape in Taurasi? 
It's Alyanikov. That's a typical question here, right? Um, so there's one important red wine or black grape, and that's Alianico. And we'll get to its characteristics in a second. And like I said, we're going to be tasting one in about 45 minutes. The white grapes, and like I said, 60% here is white, are Fiano, Falangina, and Greco di Tufo. If you want to rank them in your head, like Falangina usually <clears throat> is grown like these areas closer to the sea. It's a little lighter body, um, a great quaffing white wine. Then you have Fiano di Avellino in the middle in terms of strength. Um, and we're going to be tasting one. Um, that's like the most elegant white wine from Campania. And some people would argue uh, the finest white wine from all of Italy. Um, and then you have Greco di Tufo, which is like the fullest body, like the most powerful of these three varietals. So if you go up in like body and power, you can imagine what people would eat with that. You would start with like, if you just had like a little calamari, fried calamari appetizer with falangina, and then maybe you would have a spaghetti con vongole or something, which, which is a little more uh, creamier, you would go to your Fiano and then uh, Greco di Tufo, like um, risotto, seafood risotto, which is really fatty and creamy and needs something that, you know, can stand up to that. So, you know, this, this is where those three rank. Now, we're going to be tasting uh, Fiano, but if you know, for your tasting groups or for your own um, knowledge, what you want to do, homework, you know, get yourself a Falangina or a Greco di Tufo and see how that compares to what we tasted here. So that's, that is Campania for you. Um, Alianico, let's see, can we make this a little bigger? Yes. Can you see this a little better now? Okay, great. So this is, again, from the great wine folly, just to get an idea of what Avianico is and why it is so noble and why it has such ageability. Look at this, acidity and tannins both high. That's always the marker for a great, great uh, grape varieties with great potential. So the typical characteristics, you get peppery, particularly white pepper, you got black fruit, smoke. This is volcanic soil. Game, super gamey. Again, you know, all these white wines go really well with the fish that you get from the seaside, but then I'm talking about rugged mountains. So you have a lot of like hearty, meaty dishes, in particular game um, or rabbit, anything like that. So gamey and then blue fruits like spiced plum. Um, it's not fruity. Uh, it's, it's medium low on the fruit level, but then full body, high tannins, high acidity, and medium plus alcohol. And those are all these ingredients for a wine that has great ageability. Uh, when aged, actually, usually in Alianico's case, in what they use a lot in Italy, Slavonian oak. So they don't use French or American oak. They do use, you know, everybody is guilty of that in the, certainly in the 1990s where we just, everybody thought it's like, got to please the American palate, throw everything in new French oak, you know, it's like, it's expensive. Fortunately, a lot of these people didn't have the money to do that. So they stayed away from it. So now you get a lot, Slavonian oak is neutral and it just helps the wine age and it doesn't impart flavors in the wine. So, okay. Now, next, if I can ever get this, hello, I messed this up, sorry about that guys, bring these people back. Uh, let me just do this for a second, sorry about that, Let's see if that does it, okay. Oh, for crying out loud. I do apologize. I don't know what I did here. Let's do this. Little break. Here we go. Fiano. That's the next one. Um, 
the next important one. Again, let's look at this primary flavor. And one thing I want to point out here, hazelnut. A lot of Italian white wines, and that's something that uh, points you towards Italy. A lot of Italian white wines have a certain nuttiness about them, whether it's almond skin or almond, almondy, uh, which um, Greco di Tufo is more, where you have Fiano is more, you know, it's more uh, hazelnut characteristics. Other than that, you know, your orange peel, little pear, honeydew, melon, um, those are like the, the typical textbook characteristics of Fiano. A dry wine, medium light body, of course, no tannins, it's a white wine, medium to medium plus acidity, medium to medium plus alcohol by volume, okay? So this is what we're talking about with Fiano and we're gonna be tasting one. So, um, moving on. This is how it's gonna be. It's the Giro d'Italia here is gonna be fast. So, um, but also I want to point out, of course, you have your handouts, which are really done exactly the way we're doing the classes. So you're going to be seeing quick summary of what you're getting. Like, for example, Calabria, it'll, it'll tell you, tip of the boot, had its heydays over 2,000 years ago. I was here in Crotona. You can still, you can see ruins of buildings the Greeks built there, 2000 roads that we walked on. My winemaker tell me, it's like, you know, Aristotle or whatever walked on these roads that we're walking on right now. It's pretty cool. So this is when this part of Italy had its heydays. Um, I mentioned the high elevation here, this right here. I saw signs, I couldn't believe it, for a ski lift. I thought, I'm almost in Africa. How is that possible? It's possible because the Apennine Mountains are right there. And you know what that means? There's cool winds coming down every afternoon. Yeah. So you get wines that uh, there's hardly any imported here. It's not really a, a known region for wine in the United States, but it does have Chiro, which is right here, or right here rather. And then you have Melissa, which is right here, as two areas where you grow a grape called Galliopo. And like I said, the Greeks were there. They brought a lot of their varietals. So when you go to Southern Italy, you will find a lot of varietals that have names that sound a little Greek or are a reference to it, their Greek origin, like Nero di Troia, the black one from Troy, or, you know, Alianico really means Hellenic or Greek, although it is now doubted that this was a Greek event. But anyway, there's a reference to it. Um, Galliopo is the grape that the ancient Greeks used to toast the winners of the Olympic Games back then. Um, Greco, every time you hear the word Greco in the grape variety, it's of Greek origin. So. They were here, they brought some of their own varietals. The one, like I said, you should be familiar with is uh, Galliopo. There is some Alianico grown there, but not nearly as successful as in Campania or Basilicata. And then of course, Greco Nero, the black Greek is also one of those varietals that are um, of Greek origin. Um, and again, just as an example, when you look at your handout and you say, look at, so we have a small summarization of what's going on in this particular region and then list the key DOCs, in that case, Chiro and Melissa, and the key grape varieties so that you know what's a grape variety and what's a DOCG. That handout is what you need to study for the exam, right? Get it? Okay, cool. And again, here, a lot of volcanic rock uh, that you will find in Calabria. Moving on to Puglia or in Italian, Apulia, um, starting with an A. This area here is, was for the longest time, the 
region in Italy that produced the most wine. A lot of that wine was later used to make liquor or for, you know, medical alcohol, that kind of stuff. So this, and then a lake of wine, like, you know, went into cheap bottles or boxes and was sold at gas stations and supermarkets um, all around Europe. Now, um, like the rest of Southern Italy, there's been in, a huge increase in quality production. And I mentioned that, um, I mentioned that in the Northern part here, there's like three DOCGs that were added uh, in about 10 years ago. What Apulia is, is really two parts. You have the heel, yeah, if you cut that off, this heel is all flat. And then you have hilly areas here. So, you know, a little more elevation, sometimes not as full bodied wines because you have a, a hillier exposure. Um, Apulia is the place that gives us grape varieties like Negro Amaro, which means in English, the black bitter. It's really dark colored. It has this like textbook bitter finish. That's something too you'll find often in Italian red wines, a little bit of a bitter finish or licorice. If you can taste that in a red wine, that'll generally point you towards Italy, where as like the nuttiness in white wine. Okay, so we have Negro Amaro is one of the major varietals. We have um, Primitivo, which is which California grape variety? Zinfandel, exactly. So they're both cousins, or they're basically the same. They're both descendant of the Croatian uh, grape. Tribidrag, yes. Um, and it makes sense if you see where this is grown. Um, Primitivo di, Mandu di Manduria, which is the finest area, which is in that hot part of Italy that this, of course, is the same that they grow in some of the hottest wheat lodi and stuff, some of the hottest areas of California and it does well. It's a grape variety that just that does good in hot weather. So we have Negro Amaro, we have Primitivo, uh, we have Malvasia Nera, which is the red version of Malvasia, um, uh, and the aforementioned Uva de Troia, the, or Nero de Troia, the grape from Troy, which is grown up here more. Um, so those are the grape varieties from, from Puglia. It's mostly red wine. There is some white Malvasia, which will be a little heavier, fuller bodied. Not, of course, acidity, it's hot, it's way down. Um, but as the red wines, or for what red wines are concerned, there are some Again, some real steals like Salice Salentino is, um, let's see, let's go here to some of these appellations. Castel del Monte, that's the DOCG, or actually three different DOCG subregions that are based on Nero di Troia or Uvo di Troia. Primitivo di Manduria is your DOC, is Primitivo from Manduria, right? And then Salice Salentino is a place name. And the grape variety here is primarily Negro Amaro, usually like 80% Negro Amaro, 20% Malvasia Nera. Or as, and now I want to bring him up because I love this book so much. If you like studying Italian wines and you don't just want to look at maps and atlases or, you know, read lengthy, lengthy passages on stuff and want a more anecdotal approach, I recommend Matt Kramer's Making Sense of Italian Wine. I'm gonna- You're gonna post that? Of course, I'm gonna post it. <laughs> uh, like I said, he's a funny guy and I appreciate that. And, you know, he can sometimes, you know, make some bold statements. Um, the book is not completely up to date, but it doesn't matter. It's really, it's interesting to see how he, he lived there for a long time, how he approaches Italian wine. And the beauty is the way the book is structured is not like we do, you go region by region and have all these different grape varieties, but he just gives you, you know, an important DOC, then tells you, this is the history of that area, then tells you, these are the important producers. 
um, categorized by traditional and modernist, which is not so important here today, but will be important. We'll be talking about this about, about this a lot more next week and in two weeks, and gives you all of that, and then tells you what the locals eat to that and all that stuff. So it's kind of fun information, and uh, it's something you can always pick up. You don't have to read cover to cover. You just read it when you're picking up a falangina, and you say, I just want to read up on that again. Can you give, you know? So I think it's great for that. I am not getting uh, paid for that. Uh, I really just love that book. And I think, and it always helps me a lot every time I pick it up and read it. So he said about Salice Salentino, this wine is God's gift to pizza. And I couldn't uh, agree with him more. It's one of these wines, like what they make down here. And then we'll see next week when we go to Abruzzo with Montepulce, the, the great Montepulce. These make great trattoria wines. You know, in France, we had great bistro wines. And it's not talking down on that wine. You know, a good Cap Franc, something that can be inexpensive. It does really well with like the simple type of French food, which is still great. The simple type of Italian food, meaning pizza, panini, that kind of stuff, which is still amazing. And those wines go incredibly well with them. And guess what? They're inexpensive. It's great. This is like your perfect, uh, of course, not. I can't say Tuesday wine because you're here Tuesdays, but let's say a Monday wine, you know, when you just watch, you know, uh, reruns of Law and Order and you want to drink something that doesn't cost you more than $12 a bottle, you know, this is a great part of the world to find these wines. Um, and when 20 years ago, these wines traditionally were rustic, funky, sometimes oxidized because they didn't know how to do them better or that's just how they came out. They are now a lot more, they have this like more inky color. Um, look at wine number two in your glass. That's a, that's a primitivo. Um, you know, that type of like more a darker, inkier color uh, that would is exactly what you would expect from a uh, from a warm climate or hot climate that we are here. You're also going to be lush. They're going to be having a, a little more fruit. One question I get a lot when when we teach is like, what, what? So how would you describe the difference between Italian Primitivo and California Zinfandel? And um, it's, you still get in Italian primitivos, it's old world. So you will get a lot more like dried <clears throat> herbs, maybe some leather, you know, like non-fruit characteristics. Whereas in California, you will get a lot more of that jamminess. So raspberry jam, peach preserve, that kind of stuff, you know, where it's like cooked fruit, stewed fruit. Uh, whereas here you have overripe fruit, but with a lot of like non-fruit characteristics, okay? Cool. Um, questions about that? Oh, I see there are some chat things in here. Okay. All right. Cool. It's all about the book. That's great. Um, right. We're off to the islands and we're going to start with Sardinia. So Remember where it was when, when, we, when we looked at the um, Italian map? So if you, so you remember Sicily sits right on the tip of the boot. It's like the tip is almost like if Italy was a soccer ball and the boot would kick, kick it, you know, it's like it's right there. Sardinia is a little to the north and then really far up. It's about 150 miles off the coast of Tuscany. It's a for over there, it's a remote place. Historically, everybody owned it at some point, whether it was, you know, the, um, the Spaniards, the Basques uh, from uh, French influence, the Moors. Uh, so this is really 
Sardinia is like the melting pot in that sense of, of Italy. We'll see a lot of similarities with Sicily. Incredibly rich in culture because there was so many different cultures there at some point. But um, it is closer to the mainland, so it has more in common with the mainland, where Sardinia is its own thing. So think of it that way, you know, there's a lot of other influences in Sardinia. And interestingly enough, we'll see it with the grape varieties that we run into there, because they are the same that we'll find up in, if we go north, Corsica or um, Provence, Southern Rhone. If we go west, Spain, Basque country uh, and Catalonia, same grape varieties. They have different names here because, again, you know, it's an Italian island. So, but it's it's the same thing. Now, so super Mediterranean culture, uh, uh, climate. Sorry about that. Rugged mountains, right in the center. Again, this is mountainous. There's tons of sheep, uh, and then of course some of the most beautiful beaches you will find in Europe, um, and it's all coastline here. Um, fantastic. One more tip for you guys who, you know, if you don't want to just toil over this. And I mentioned this before, Jeff Porter's SIP trip. It's all about trips to Italy that he's like the, or tries to be at least the Anthony Bourdain of Italian wine. Go to a place, have a lot of fun, film it, put it out in like 12 to 15 minute episodes. Great to watch. You don't have to invest three hours in this. You can, when you feel like it, watch it for 12 minutes and see like, hey, those are, this is my experience in Sardinia. And it's always something, you know, that you can take from these. Um, plus, of course, most importantly, the images, what it actually looks like, because that's a map with a bunch of colors on it, you know. So that doesn't tell you how high the mountains are, right? But you watch these things, they're really helpful for that. Now let's get into, um, so what do we grow here? The number one red wine variety from Sardinia is a grape called Canona. And the best expressions are usually from like the southern part of the island here. The name on the label would be Canona di Sardinia. Yeah, Canona from Sardinia, easy enough. Uh, Canona is the same as which French or Spanish grape? Say it loud, say it proud. I heard it. Grenache, exactly. So Canona is the same that the French call Grenache and the Spaniards call Garnacha. See what I mean with that influence already there? So, like, oh, we'll all grow the same grape variety. Um, when it comes to white wine, the best area is up here. It's a white wine called Vermentino. If it's from the larger appellation, or it's, it's a DOC of Sardinia, it will just be Vermentino di Sardinia. There's one DOCG, Vermentino di Galura, and that's up north here. Um, see this pinkish color. Um, so Vermentino, a uh, great dry little lemony white wine, little nuttiness, of course, because it's Italian, great with grilled seafood. Um, Grenache or Canonau to describe it would be to me like the typical Grenache always has like a little raspberry sauce. A lot of people say, books put strawberry first all the time. I get raspberry first, so whatever you get, but it's red fruit, strawberry, raspberry. What else did we learn about Grenache? Get a, it can get a lot high, high in alcohol, but a little lower in body. Uh, there's something about Canona that distinguishes, in my mind, to Grenache and Garnacha is there's a little, almost like a spiciness in it that is um, really typical to that island. Um, again, a delightful red wine um, that also is really inexpensive to get. Um, other than those two, we have uh, a couple of more white wine varieties, Vernaccia and Malvasia. Uh, Vernaccia is also grown in Tuscany, and I told you it's like it's basically the same latitude, so that makes perfect sense. Vermentino is grown in France under the name Roll, R O L L E, 
Uh, you'll find it in Piedmont under the name Favorita. So that's also a grape variety that's not just in Sardinia, because none of them really are, but also other parts of the Mediterranean. Again, cementing what I said before, this is Mediterranean uh, as Mediterranean can get is Sardinia. Uh, in terms of grapes that we grow there, food that we eat, um, and um, you know, and, of, and certainly <coughs> Then we have, so Canonao is the same as Grenache. Carignano that they grow there is the same as Carigno um, or Mazzuelo in, in, in Spain. Uh, and of course, some international varieties. Uh, one of the first, and we're gonna hear that name next week. He was one of the first people to, he was basically, the winemaker that was behind the super Tuscan revolution in Tuscany, Giacomo Takis, he is Sardinian. And he also makes his own wines that are in that super Tuscan, meaning we're gonna learn a lot more about this next week. Just in a, in a, in a nutshell what that means, I'm making a wine in a non-traditional way with non-traditional grape varieties based on you know, what they've done so well in Bordeaux rather than in where we're from. And I'm going to market it to the American audience. Yeah. It's kind of, it sounds kind of silly, but they're fantastic wines. They really are. Barua is one of them that Takis makes in, uh, uh, in Sardinia that I can only, you know, if you ever see that on a wine list or in a wine shop to taste something that's really good and top notch from Sardinia. So then that would be your wine from there. Let me just take a quick look at the chat here. Okay, sip trip, perfect. Um, so you'll see now we don't have that much. There's no volcanic. This is more granite and limestone. You can see we already learned that about limestone, certainly with the white one, and also with the Canada, which it means is gives it a little more uh, potential for higher acidity. All right. Moving on to Sicily. Now, when I said before uh, that Sicily is probably right now the most exciting place in, in all of Italy to make wine, and in particular this right here, because that's the uh, Etna Rosso or Mount Etna area. So historically, uh, yes, everybody was at some point. Everybody was in Sicily. The Greeks, you know, the Moors, everybody, every uh, you know, marauding group of people that wanted to invade somebody, they did that with Italy, uh, with Sicily. So there's a lot of different cultures in there. Sicily has a lot of its own indigenous varietals, white or red. Uh, they also make. Uh, a wine that, a fortified wine that was once the most famous wine from that island, in particular in the UK. And that was uh, Marsala, which is all from the uh, westernmost part um, of Sicily. Other than that, what can we imagine the climate to be? Hot. It's, it's hot Mediterranean down there, especially if you're in lower lying areas. So again, Ample sunshine, a lot of heat, growing grapes there generally, no problem. You can get, you can make a lot. And that was exactly like in Puglia and like in all of these other places in the South, the problem that people did that for too long because they were poor. They didn't know what else to do. Now it's a different story. Now you have people, you heard, you hear that name in two weeks, but one of the most famous names in Italian, why not Angelo Gaia and say, it's like, I'm gonna buy some property in Sicily. I can't buy any more in Barbaresco or Baba Barolo or even in Bulgari where the super Tuscans are from. I can't, I can't do that anymore. It's all sold. You know, I can find stuff there. This is the next where we can go. Um, so in the 1980s, it started. Diego Planeta for sure is one of these um, names that changed the game there. People that saw the potential. Uh, in the 80s um, and, and 
early 90s, like in other parts of Italy, where people thought it's like, we got this great soil here, we got this great climate, should be able to make some good wine and sell it for a lot of money if we get the right equipment. Often what they did was ripping out indigenous varietals and planting Cabernet, Syrah, Merlot, Chardonnay, because that's what sold around the world. Now, with one exception, Campania. Mastro Berardino, who I mentioned, was like, uh 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 uh, uh. we're going to be sticking to our local varietals. We're not going to be messing around that much with international varietals. In Sicily, that was done much more. Sometimes, really good. Are they easy to sell here? I don't know, not anymore, because, you know, people ask, it's like, why should I get a Chardonnay from Sicily when I can get one from California and Chablis, you know? So uh, it's, it has become a little harder. Fortunately for Sicily though, they have a lot of their own great grape varieties. Um, probably right now the most popular in the United States as an easy quaffing red wine would be Nero Davola, right? I'm sure you all have heard that and have seen that on as an inexpensive by the glass red. This is again, one of those you know, God's gift to pizza wines where you go like, oh, this is great. I can have, you know, a bottle for whatever, $12, $14. It's, it's well-made. It's easy to drink. Uh, very palatable for the American palate in terms of like you get a lot more fruit and you get some body to it, which people generally, especially men here, like their red wines to be. Um, when it comes from these like flatter areas, it's, and or down south here, and especially from cooperatives, it's a fairly easy wine, but it can also, it can be become very nuanced and more elegant if it's made by the right winemakers. Um, uh, and in particular down here, where blended with it, the, the town of Victoria with the other grape they grow there, Frappato, for the only DOCG that Sicily had, which is um, Cerasuolo di Vittoria. Now, let's get back for a second because I'm saying stuff like Nero Davola. What's the grape? What's the place? Yeah, it's from Avola still. Nero, sometimes they just say it's the black or the red wine from that place. Or it's a Bianco di Custoza. Then it's still like it's a white wine, usually a blend of different ones from the town of Custoza. Uh, Cera Suolo also means more has to do with the color because it had a unique color from Vittoria, but that is Frappato, it was a great. So we still have that logic of where the D is and what the wines are called. So, and here by the way is Avula where, uh, you know, that Nero Davula is named after, although it really was proven later on with DNA and now it's a grape called Calabrese, so it originally came from Calabria, but you know, they didn't know that back then. Okay, but let's pay attention to uh, what not just I, but what a lot of people think uh, these days is the most important area, and that is this here, Etna Rosso or Etna Bianco from Mount Etna again. Mount Etna is an active volcano. I don't know if you saw that last year in the news. It erupted. It, it's not like, oh yeah, it erupted 50 years ago. No, 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 no. Like maybe even this year, last year. Do, do you happen to know? Yeah, exactly. So really recent, an active volcano, super volcanic, so high elevation. That's the key here. And there's a reason why you have this weird shape of that wine region is because there's some part here where you just can't grow the grape because this is where the magma or the lava when the volcano erupts flows off and yeah, good luck planting your vineyard there. You know, it's going to be gone in two years. Yeah. So volcanic soil, elevation, which is great in this hot climate. It's really great. And now, uh, actually a push 
for the first time down there, single vineyard appellations. We have people now, which we'll see, this is the first time in the South, but we see that in places like Sagrantino, in Umbria, in Tuscany, definitely first saw it uh, for a reason in Barolo and Barbaresco, where winemakers are now is like, man, we could really do what the French are doing. We can make single vineyard wines, which are totally unique. Only we can make them. And, you know, give, with the given time of like making these single vineyards where we can taste like, if this plot will produce better wines, maybe we can even get it a Grand Cru or something. Yeah. So that's what's going on there. Um, the major grape for red wines, and again, we're going to have one here today, uh, um, uh, Mount Etna wine, is uh, Nerello is the grape. So there's two clones that are usually used. Nerello Mascalese. Uh, it's probably on the next slide. Here, here we go. Nerello Mascalese. Mascalese named after Mascali. That's a little town uh, on Mount Etna. So it's that called Nerello Mascalese. Usually the traditional or blend of these is 80% Nerello Mascalese and then 20% Nerello Cappuccio, which is a grape that's a, a clone that's a little softer. So it softens up the, the Mascalese. And the way they achieve that is, like with this producer, who I know very well because we import them, they always grow four rows of Mascalese and one row of Cappuccio. 80, 40, right? So you always know that. Um, there is, where they, these guys are, is a natural national park, which is also great. So they're really undisturbed up there on Mount Etna when it comes to making their wines and growing their grapes, which is great. And I guess hopefully now after saying all these things, you understand why people from not just from uh, Northern Italy that have the money, but from all over Europe or maybe the world are trying to buy property there and do uh, and, and grow grapes and make wine. Christine, yes. How close to the to and are the vineyards? Are they? They're on the mountain. They're, on the, they're pretty hot. They're on the hill. Yeah, I mean, listen, this Mount Etna is huge. Uh, yeah. So you'll see, like the craters of it. There's still some a lot of distance, so it's not like. That's why, you know, that you can't be on the side where the lava flows off. You but just can't be. Oh, yeah. yeah so, there. but you have in the air, I mean, you see that when you see these images, I mean, the ash that's coming, yeah. you know, and it covers everything. You, so a lot of times with Nerello Mascalese, you have like this flavor of like volcanic ash. Uh, volcanic soil to me also often tastes a little bit like blood. It's like a high iron content. So remember when you, maybe, well, you know, hopefully you never mm -hmm. had this, but if you have like your gums bleed a little or you bite your lip on the inside and you taste your own blood. Uh, and it's that, that ironiness. That's what that reminds me of. I'm not a vampire, so <laughs> it's not about my own blood here. Okay. Um, super excited. So I mentioned like uh, Donna Fugata is another famous. You will have at the end of the presentation also in your handout lists of the most notable producers. We, of course, cannot mention everyone that's important, but when it comes to the south of Italy, I mentioned Mastro Berardino, Foyti di San Gregorio, for, um, also for Campania, Agiolas for um, Sardinia, Dettori, also for Sardinia, um, Planeta, Gulfi, Paternoster, Occhi Pinti, which they are down here. And they, um, they're like every sommelier in New York's darling right now because they do all the amphora fermentation, you know? So they, you know, like this old school style of um, aging their wines in amphora, um, which, you know, the uh, 2021 Psalms really love. Uh, so that's all coming from you. So there is a lot of excitement. I didn't mention, the white wine varieties, but let's go to this chart here. So volcanic soil, yeah, we get it. Appalachian, the most important, well, to me or to all of us really is now Etna Rosso. The only DOCG is 
Cerasuolo di Vittoria, that will be on your handout. Um, key grape varieties, Nerello Mascalese, Nerello Capuccio, Frappato, Nero Davola, which as I said, is really a grape called Calabrese. And then when we come to white wines, we have Caricante, which is also grown on Mount Etna and makes Etna Bianco. Very cool white wine from there. Uh, we have surrounding, uh, surrounding Sicily. We have all these little islands where you make great dessert wines, um, based often based on the Moscato grape. Grillo and Insolia are uh, typical white wines. Again, with that 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 typical like Italian nuttiness to it, and a lot of these also our base of Marsala wines, the fortified wines in the West. So this is what we're looking at in Sicily. Um, let's take a brief look. Let me just see how much we have. Yeah, this is the last one here. Brief look at Nerello Mascalese, what we're getting, what to expect from that because we're gonna be tasting one. So wild strawberries, to me like wild forest berries, a lot of that. Wild forest berries, sweet cherry, leather, cinnamon, and volcanic rocks, you know, and then I get, you know, in volcanic soil often a lot of that high iron contents so like a little bloody. Um, it's got plenty of fruit, which we know Alianico, for example, doesn't have. We just saw that show. Uh, body is a lot lighter. Again, makes sense because it's grown up, it's grown in high elevation, so, you know, yeah, you get the sun, but you don't get the same ripeness because the temperature is cooler. Makes more elegant wines. Uh, medium tannins, medium plus acidity, and medium alcohol. This is all makes sense when you look at it from like a place perspective. Again, like higher elevation in uh, mountains growth. And with that, and let me just look at the time here. Great, 7.30. We have perfect enough time for the tasting portion. So let me just sum up some of the most important things here. Uh, and that's, again, like market analysis discussion, that's what you can discuss when you taste wines in your group design. It's a great place for value wines now. Campania and Sicily and Apulia, I wanna say those three in particular, Sardinia also, uh, Calabria and Basilicata, a little less because we don't find these wines in them, but which are your favorite? Why do you like them? Express that. Um, and then that there's a number of boutique wineries and you will be running across them. You go shopping in your, uh, you know, in your local boutique wine shop. Chances are like somebody will chat you up there, like an employee or there will be a tasting and somebody will be telling you about Sicilian wines because, you know, like I said, uh, right now they are actually uh, very, very popular. Here are again some of the notable producers, like I said, yeah, Occupinti, uh, Planeta, all these, the usual suspects, and that's all us. Let me stop the share here and Take questions from you. Yeah. One question about how the wines are grown. Are they trellis because of the heat? No, the heat, it's a hot area, right? Because it's in the south. Once you're up in high elevation, like I said, you go up a thousand feet, temperature drops on average three and a half Fahrenheit. It's perfect growing there. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I mean. But I, what you expect as like the macro climate to be. This is a case of a microclimate, really. Because you're going up so in it's elevation. Like it's a perfect environment. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I was reading some area has bush bumps, though, right? Yeah. Some yeah. areas. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I don't see any anything, any questions here on the chat. So let us take out our. Um, uh, let me give. Follow 
And you know, I, so what? I, yeah, I just want to get an idea here from you guys. So, what do you think is the most difficult or maybe confusing thing about Italian wines? What you just heard? I think for a lot of people, I mean, the thing that turns is intimidating is just the sheer amount of grape varieties. Yeah. yeah. I totally get it. I'm in the Italian wine trade. I get it, you know. But look at it this way. It's exciting. I mean, you, we're not going to be asking you for uh, all these obscure varieties. We prepared something for you, a handout where, you, where we guide you how to study for this. Like I said, you know, there are some, like when we talked about France, there are some, not all appellations are the same. There are some that are just more important. And with Italy, it's the same thing. Some DOCs are more important than others. We will point them out as I did today. So if you took your notes, you know what's important in Campania. I pointed it out. Or in Sicily, what the important grape varieties are. But yes, every time I go to Italy or to an Italian, big Italian wine show, I can guarantee you, and I've been in the Italian wine trade for 20 years. I had a share in a vineyard in Italy starting back in 1996 or 25 years ago. I, you know, certainly not a novice to Italian wine. I come across a grape variety I've never heard of before in my life every time. And you know what I am? I'm happy. Wow, this is cool. It never gets old, right? So see that as an opportunity. I know like the studying part is overwhelming, but what I want you to get is this. The things that we tell you about, memorize what's a place name and what's a grape name. That's important. You don't want to embarrass yourself and say that Barolo is a grape, because it's not. Or insist that Chianti is a grape. Or like an Italian waiter once did uh, in, uh, when I went to Vin Italy at Lago di Garda and had a dinner with other business friends and we were wanted to know what grape variety uh, was in his Bianco di Custosa when he insisted that it's a grape called Bianco. And I walked away, it's like, yeah, you clearly sold shoes yesterday. You, know, you have no idea what you're talking about here. But, right, you get that? Anytime there's questions about this, what we cover today or next week, or you reach out to me. Would you study that material? Would you look, read the book? Read the handouts, there's questions. You do the quizzes, which you need to do again, do them. They're for you to prepare yourself. You have questions, you reach out. All right, let's taste. Yeah. Um, so we do wine number one in the familiar style. Uh, now we've all done this plenty of times. It, this is a fairly light white wine. I know like it's really hard to see sometimes these things. So why don't you guys help me? TJ, you were here so early that you got the front row seat. Why don't you help me with sight here? So what are we looking? And fast. So we got, how clear is it? Uh, clear. clear, exactly. Brightness? Bright. Bright, yep. Intensity? Um, medium. Yeah, medium to medium minus, right? Yeah, medium, maybe. That's so this all didn't tell us a whole lot about this one, right? Nothing. But that's okay. It doesn't have to. We'll just we'll go through this mode, but when it does, we will know. Okay, now what's the color here? Uh green to straw. Yeah. Straw is great. Yeah. Do you see a secondary color? Um, no secondary color? I don't see one either. It's hard to see. This is a very clear, this already points to us. It's like, this is very light and clear, probably young, definitely a cooler climate. That's what we can deduct so far from the site, right? Uh, no reverberation, no gas evidence, no sediments. Yes. Yeah. How is it swirling? Medium plus. Yeah. And extraction. 
No, no. no extraction. It's a white wine. So let's extraction. We we do uh, you know how much of the grape was extracted in it. So this is nothing. We don't have to worry about. But the viscosity is how is it moving? It's still moving pretty fast. The tears are moving down pretty fast. So this is not medium to medium minus. I would say. Yeah. Great. Thanks, DJ. You will always get, we had this question before, but I'm glad you're bringing it up again because we had it before. Sometimes you see like one bubble or like three next to each other on the rim. When you pour wine, when you swirl wine, you can trap oxygen. This is not gas evidence that we mean. Gas evidence that we mean in wine is what we learned last week. What did we learn last week about winemaking? It was different in champagne than the rest. A, bar, a wine re-ferments in the bottle. There's a second fermentation. That gas gets trapped. Now, when you make champagne, that's what you want. When you make a white wine and you didn't really filter it well and you left some, there's some, which there usually is with white wine, some residual sugar left, you didn't filter out all or find out all the yeast, that will re-ferment. And then you will have bubbles in that wine. And that's the gas evidence that we don't, because that tells you, let's say, I'm drinking, we know what this is, you know, whatever, I'm drinking a Southern Italian white wine, there shouldn't be bubbles in here. But I'm not talking about the one or the three from, or if I just pour you wine, you would have a little bubbles in here. Yeah, that's not what we're talking about. Okay, cool. Let's continue. Um, Logan. You want to give me the nose? Yeah. yeah. Uh, clean condition, medium intensity. Um, not much fruit. I'm gonna say fruit. I'm gonna say ripe stone fruits. Great. Yeah, this is I mean, again. This is not one of these like when we compare this to what we tasted, what we smelled in Alsace, where these wines are really aromatic. This is not that category here. This is subdued. I love that analysis. So you just get a hint of fruit. Yeah, I mean, I almost can't pick out specific fruits because mm -hmm. I can mostly just smell like prosciutto or ham with a little bit of pepper, like something savory, mm -hmm. and then some gravel, maybe some more bitter. Right. Yeah, so there's on the lows a lot of non fruit things that are going on here, which again, like if we had this at a blind tasting, would put us. Certainly, the old world. Yeah. Are you guys picking up this? What I said before, this hazelnut. Can you try and? I mean, sometimes it helps when you hear it because then you remember what it smells like, and then you smell it in the wine. So tiny little little nutty. I mean, I have again. Like, if you don't know what that smells like, go to. Whole foods or whatever, you know, grab some hazelnuts, crush them, and mm -hmm. smell them. Uh, yes, or eat Nutella. There's mm -hmm. plenty in there. <laughs> okay, cool. Logan, let's continue with the nose. So, fruit condition. Ripe, okay, yeah. Some yes, great. The herbaceousness, you got us. Um, like not peppers, but like white and black peppers. White, yeah, no, definitely. White pepper, I get that too. Yeah. And then a little bit of gravel. Gravelly, yeah. And uh, wet gravel. Wet gravel, a little salinity too. Huh? Do you get this? Little saltiness, salinity. Okay. Um, anybody else, anything? Cheryl, did you pick up anything in there that? We haven't mentioned yet. It's not easy. It's not this wine is not, it doesn't jump at you. It's very elegant and fine and restrained in that way. Can we say light intensity or light intensity? Yeah. Yeah. Light or medium minus. Yeah. Light and yeah. Very plain, like Yeah. Yeah. Fennel floral. Yeah. Totally. Uh, so um, 
So in terms of like that earthy minerality, you had gravel. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. This will all be really interesting when we taste it. See what, because we're going to be tasting more than we're smelling. Okay. Now, secondary aromas. I think for most of this, there isn't really anything here, right? There's no, um, we don't have this, what we have with champagne, right? Remember the autolytic uh, from a lot of like lease aging, uh, not, not the brioche or breadiness that you see here on the nose. Um, you get butter, cream or cheese. I know I, because I know this producer, he does a tiny bit of malolactic, but you don't detect it. Yeah. So there is very little of that. If the, so if you write none, that's perfectly fine because I certainly don't detect it either. Yeah. Okay, cool. Oak. Is there oak in this one? Detectable oak in this one? Do you get vanilla? Do you get dill? Do you get baking spices? No. Huh? Sure. I don't. Yeah. So you can assume it's stainless steel uh, and if oak is used on some of it then it's a very small percentage and it's neutral oak which would make sense because it's Italy like I said we do a lot of Slavonian <coughs> neutral oak. Okay great. Uh, I don't think there's nothing tertiary here. How about the development of this wine? Young. young yeah. It tastes young. It's bright. It's still it does like I said the beauty here is it doesn't punch you in the nose with aromas. It doesn't come out too aggressive, but it has like a playfulness to it. And that's the youth. And it's like a vibrancy when you smell it, uh, like that stone fruit. And I get some citrusy aspects too, which uh, smell young. And the side certainly also confirming the side look like it's a young wine. Okay, now, Let's do, let's just continue here. Lindsay, do you want to give us something on the palate? Yes. So let's taste it. Uh, <laughs> Jimmy, show your neighbor how to taste it. How to taste the what? Yeah, no, but you can help out your. Oh. Oh. <coughs> mm. mm -hmm. That citrus is coming out much more now. Yeah. Acidity. Do the test. Do the acid test. You don't have to. It just your mouth is watering. Remember when I told you where this is why this wine is from? When we do a lot of seafood, perfect palate cleanser. So, okay, but let's stick with the uh, program here. Um, fruit, uh, Lindsay. Fruit condition here on the palate. Ripe to sometimes underripe a little. Has a little green, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That brightness, fruit. Um, yeah, so citrus and stone, I'd say. Yeah. We have like some lemon, maybe like ripe apple and pear. Pear is great, yeah. And then, um, I feel like you get a little bit of that min minerality. Or maybe green apple too, now that you Um. Yeah, I mean, a lot of fruit on the palate, I think, compared to the nose. Yeah, Not and then pay attention at the end, because that's what I think you get that salinity a little bit, mm -hmm. where it's like a little saltiness in that wine. Yeah. Which is something, you know, again, you're like very close to the ocean there. Um, you know, you have uh, this type, like, like limestone volcanic soil. There is like a salinity in this wine. And they uh, put some of their wines in the ocean, right? Like, in this area, I was reading that they actually would use it as a cellar. They would use the ocean as a cellar. The ocean as a cellar. I've, I've never uh, read that, but you, you might be right. I mean, there might be somebody who does that, but like mm -hmm. these guys are pretty far inland. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that would really make sense to them, but. Um, you know, like somebody who's right by the coast, you know, that is very much possible. Um, so, okay, herbaceousness. Yes. I 
I was going to say, like, it's, I mean, we're talking about it in the context of red wine, but it seems to have that kind of bitter finish. Yeah. It's like almost grassy, but not like fresh grass, maybe like dried. Not oregano, that's too intense of a thing to say, but like something, yeah, something like, more like right spice. Yeah. Great. And uh, remember that, you know, that that little bitter finish, like bitter and salty, which is, you know, for some people, that would be a little revolting. Yeah. For some people, you know, they want, they want that, you know, they want their oaky, big, fruity <coughs> wine. This is the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. And if you like that, it's really cool. And can you imagine how much better this is with food? And how much better this will make food taste because it cleanses it. It has this bitterness. Uh, it has the the uh, the salinity. Uh, um, absolutely delightful. That's a perfect example of an old world wine, and in that sense, also an Italian wine. Uh, because of Italian, a lot of Italian white wines will be in that direction. It's that, and then the exception to me is Malvasia, which is like low acid and fuller body, more fruit, but really as almost the only exception there. Yeah. Very cool. Um, what else do we have to cover here? Uh, let's see. So we got all of that, the floral a little bit. We got the spice, the white pepper comes back, the salinity. Um, you know, that, you know, Still a little gravelly, I would say limestoney because of the high acidity when it comes to earthiness. Uh, secondary flavors. I still don't get butter or uh, doughiness, like uh, autolytic quality. Uh, I don't get any um, hint on oak aging on this wine, nothing, right? It's pretty clean, straightforward. You can taste everything. Uh, so we can take that off. Tertiary flavor, it still tastes like a young wine. Um, so where do you put it development-wise? It's young. Yeah. It tastes young. How long do you age? That's a great question. We're going to get to this in a little bit under impression. But let's see. say this first. This wine tastes young because... It's very green. It's very mouthwatering. It's like that, that playfulness that it has. Uh, do you think this wine will hold out for a long time? No. Not for a very long time. I doubt it. And, um, let's just check what the... This is a 2020, so yes, indeed, very young wine. Oh, oh. Uh, last year, 2020. It's a COVID wine. <laughs> <laughs> COVID vintage, yes. Um, and I would give it three to five years, but not more than that, right? Uh, what it will do, because it's, it's, relative, it's elegant, it's delicate. What happens when this wine ages? Whatever we have in fruit is going to go. The acidity is high enough that it will still have light. Maybe there's going to be some cool secondary uh, aromas that will appear. The acidity will give it life. That's why I'm ready to say five years. I would taste this wine again in like, yeah, 2026, 20, 2025, see what happened to it. I think it has life. Acidity is life. Uh, so, but it doesn't have all of these other things that would give it, uh, would make, I don't think it would be interesting to taste this older, frankly. Anyway, uh, I would totally enjoy it without food as well, because that is, just goes right up my alley, what I'm tasting here. I don't want too much food, but it would be great with food. But I can totally get it if somebody says like, Oh, it's a little too maybe tart or uh, bitter or, you know, salty for me. I get it. Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, but I'm glad we're all in agreement on these, these particular things here. Now, let's look at the structure of the wine. 
Condition. Um, who's after? Oh, Laura, let's do you. Clean condition, absolutely, yeah. Intensity? Yeah. Medium is fine with me. Like I said, we didn't, how many things did we, like that's how we commented on this wine that it doesn't really overwhelm us in a way. It's like, it's more elegant and they make, so I would, I would stick with medium here, but if, if you get a little more medium plus, that's, that's okay. Sweetness. Yeah, definitely. Dry to bone dry. There's there is no residual sugar left in here. The acidity is relatively high. So yeah. Um, medium plus acidity. Don't worry about the tannins. Well, this is the texture of the tannins since we don't have any uh, body. Body medium. Yeah, medium to medium minus. Yeah. Right. Do you, so I don't know. I mean, I didn't get, my mouth didn't go hot. I didn't get the alcohol. Remember what Denise was saying where she gets to like upper part of the nose. I didn't get any of this. To me, it's medium. Yeah, this is not, and let's check because this is, I have that here, it's 13%. So that's medium. That's not high in these days for wine anymore. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. It lingers around. Yeah, that's a good good point. Okay. Impression. Diego. Oh, world. Yeah. Cool, cool. I mean, not really cool. Like, this is cool to warm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But not hot for sure. Uh, quality. It is very good. Yeah. Uh, and you say an age range for either three to five. That's right. right, now, right now, it's water. At readiness, I could I think you can drink this right now. You don't have to decant it, you don't have to hold it, but you could for a few years. Okay. Conclusion. What do we got here? We have this is Fiano um, from Campania. I'll put the, uh, I took a picture, I'll put that, post that in the name of the wine for you. 2020 uh, producer is Tempani Zoe, and it's got 13% alcohol. Okay, cool. Red wine. Let's do wine number two. If, and if, as always, of course, what we do when we go through these slides, if you disagree with anything that you hear here, say it, you know, then we'll talk it out. Okay. Um, Devin, you want to give us the uh, color? Yeah. Yeah, look at the other ones, the other ones when you, because you cannot, you can really see your fingers through wine number three and wine number four. This is, compared to those, this is pretty dark here. It's almost opaque, exactly. So uh, go with uh, go with that intensity to deep or opaque, yeah? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, really dark, ruby. Uh, Almost when you look at it, sometimes it always comes up as almost purplish, yes. you know, as a secondary color. Yeah, which is really good. You jot that, that's the stuff to write down because now this tells us something. You know, if a wine is that intense and opaque and purplish, it's probably from a warm climate. Mm. It's most almost most, of, I mean, there are very few examples where you have wines that look like that, where they're from a cooler mm. area, but. The general norm is that this will point us to a warmer climate and exclude certain grape varieties like P. 
Pinot Noir will not look, look like that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Very good. Um, rim variation. Yeah, there's a little, right? Get, it's getting a little like dark orange on the rim. Um, gas evidence. No, I have one bubble in here, Diego. If you want to check that out, that doesn't mean it's <laughs> okay. No particles or sediments out in my glass. Maybe somebody else who had the last of the bottle, but no. Uh, all right, cool. Then viscosity. How does it move around? Devin, it's still you. Yeah, that's fine with me. Yeah. Anybody else? Do you, any, if anybody disagrees, let, let us know. And extraction, because now we're talking about extract. This is like, how much does it look like, you know, this was extracted from the skins. If usually it often runs pretty parallel with viscosity. Because if there's a lot of viscosity, it means there's like just so much more that was extracted from that grape. So I would give that a medium to medium plus as well. Yeah, is that clear? Okay, good, cool. Uh, <laughs> Katrina, let's do the nose. Smells like smooth, like fruits, for sure, like red black fruits. And like, yeah. And it's like prunes or plums or like red berries. Um, definitely getting a little like licorice. And I smell maple in there, like a tiny bit of like fresh like syrup. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, even a little mint with like a little tiny bit. Yeah, the mint is a great call. I'm getting a lot of those, like just a lot of little ones of like the herbal. Dried herbs, yeah. This is like, you know, when you know what it is and you get this thing, yeah, this is exactly what the descriptor of this wine would tell you. Dried herbs, and you get that. Yeah. Okay, where were we? Um, sorry. So yeah, we got a lot of dried herbs. Uh, I'm getting tobacco from this. Tobacco, sweet tobacco, yeah. Cool. Uh, spice? Yeah, we have tobacco, licorice, that's great. Um, maple? Perfect. Some violence, violence, yeah. Great call. Yeah. And again, like, you know, when you think like when you see sometimes you see purple in a wine, you could smell that. And like what smells purple? Violet is purple, you know. Great. Okay. Um Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Limestone, or could be a little clay too. You know, it sounds it's rounder. Yeah. Okay, cool. Then um secondary. Do you get anything that points to the yeast or aging or malolactic? I mean really no. no. I mean it's a red wine, so you can assume it underwent malolactic because they kind of all do. Uh, just by that's how they do it. Yeah. Uh, but you don't pick up, you pick up that sometimes when we talk about cheese here, whether that's the butteriness. Okay, cool. Um, aging. Is that, does that smell like oak or any oak that we know? I don't think so. I don't get, do you get vanilla? Do you get the baking spices? I get like anything if I would bet, like not even stainless steel or concrete aging. Okay. Uh, tertiary, it's 
not really here because it's a younger wine. Uh, so, I mean, if anything, are the, what's the condition of the fruit? What did we say here? It's more like a, it's it's re, it's a ripe fruit, right? For sure, it's from ripe to getting stewed a little. Okay, but not dried fruit. Okay, cool. Yeah, just want to make sure we're all on the same page here. Um, development. Yeah, young, developing. Yeah, somewhere up there. Okay, uh, palate, Cheryl. Let's taste it. Definitely ripe. That black fruit, berries and cherries. Yeah. Yeah. You get the black cherry for sure. That's the color of the cherry here. Black cherry. Little more. It's still that, um, that bitter finish too, yeah. just like it cuts right off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The violet licorice. The violet comes out dying that you can taste violet, right? Mm -hmm. What are these violet pasties that we have in Europe? You can get it tastes know, just like that. Yeah. yeah. It's just like that. Okay. Uh, so we got that. Yeah. So again, isn't that great to see like color purple? We we taste we smell the violet. Now we taste it really intense. Um, you get that bitter finish, but you do have a lot more fruit on the palate than you had on the nose. And I can tell you for an Italian red wine, that's a lot of fruit in here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, nothing, nothing really savory to say. Not much acid, um, more, maybe more clay minerality. Mm -hmm. What about, yeah, so let's, let's go because that's important structure wise. Intensity. Really yeah, still. Oh, 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 yeah, Christine, please go ahead. If you want to. 16, um, medium plus. The tannins make it dry. I feel like it's very dry. So tannins are there, right? Yeah. They're there, but texturally, they're, I, listen, are they like really harsh tannins? Uh, they're not. We, we taste more red wine. You get, uh, you know, tannins that are much harsher than this. So this is like somewhere between, it's almost smooth. It's a little chalky still. You know, when you scrape the top of your uh, roof with your tongue, you can get like, it's still a little chalky, but it's on the side of rounder, smoother. But the tannins are there. There definitely is like quantitatively, they're high. And guess what? Otherwise you wouldn't get that deep of a color, you know? And again, like a wine like that just looks like that. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's do this again. Intensity. You said what? Medium plus. Medium plus yeah. Perfect. Sweetness. The dry. Dry. Yeah. It's not bone dry. It's dry. The, the fruit still ha it has some um, hint of RS. Acidity. Slightly medium, medium minus. Yeah. Great. Um, Tannins are, medium, medium minus. Tannins are not medium minus. Medium. No, they, that's how many do we have? Quantitatively, they're here. That's what I mean. The tannins are quantitatively, there's a lot of them, but how are they? How do they feel in your mouth? Again, look at that wine, look at the color. It will have a lot of tannins. A wine that's that dark in color will never be medium minus tannins. But the tannins can be smooth, so you don't get what we had in some of the other wines that we tasted, where it completely dries out our mouth. Right, so that's the difference here. Well, I'm glad we're going over this again because it's a, that's important to learn. So would it be okay to say the tannins are smooth as a relatively? To... Yeah, yeah, they are because for the amount that we have, they don't make our mouth that 
crazy dry. Yeah, but they're medium plus. They're medium plus, yeah, medium plus tannins and on round, uh, yeah, smoother texturally wise. Body. Medium yeah, perfect. Alcohol. I say medium, but I still it. It's got a, you know, huh? Yeah. It's got a kick to it. Yeah. Ooh, so get the, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it does. Uh, let me see. It says thirteen percent on here. I don't believe it. It's got to be a little more. Yeah, that can happen. Uh. Complexity, I wouldn't go high on this one. I would say it's pretty medium. I mean, it's got fruit, it comes, it goes, it doesn't excite us too much. Medium, not more on this. Medium? Not more, yeah. Even, even medium to simple, if I had to pick one direction. Balanced, yeah, it's balanced. Finish? Medium. Okay, now this is a case. Try this again. Is it really a pleasant finish? Like when we remember drinking the Burgundies and Bordeaux, like that? It fades out. It's 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 more like a finish, I feel like. Yeah. I but and I, that's my impression of it. Um So I got about ten seconds that I can taste this wine. And then the fruit goes, you know, and then I get the, you know, that my mouth dries out a little bit. So I'd still, I'd say that's a medium mm -hmm. finish. Okay. But that's counted, you know, just from the time either you swallow it or you spit it, just count the seconds, how long it tastes like that wine that you first had in your mouth. You know, once that the fruit's gone and then you just get other things, that doesn't count. You know. So how long you can taste that one? It's about 10 seconds here. Okay. <laughs> now, Christine, I'm gonna let you finish this one off with impression. It is old world. It is old world, but this is the first wine that as I would argue that we tasted here in our program so far, uh, with the exception of the, the Vinnie Vinnie class where we actually had some new world wine that is, the first one where we are really a little more heavier on the fruit side, but you are right, yes. And in particular, considering what grape variety we're talking about, this is an old world primitivo. This is not New World Zinfandel. New World Zinfandel, you would have a lot more jammy fruit here. You have a lot more like marmalade. Like I said, I get a lot of like, you know, fruit marmalade. Um, than what we, what we have here. So old world, great. Climate? Yeah, warm to hot. Remember, we have a lot of color. You detected more alcohol than the bottle says, but high alcohol, low acidity, lot of color, lot of extract, all that stuff points you to a hot climate. So most of the times we will be in the warm. So let's just now, because we actually can pick, let's pick hot because it actually is that way. Okay, cool. Um, age range. <coughs> so, one to three years. Yeah, perfect. I love that assessment. I would not put that, uh, you know, this one is, uh, it's fairly simple. Yeah. You know, it's got some fruit, and that's it. One to three years. Uh, and that means also your readiness. Drink this thing now. Awesome. Okay. Uh, if. Oh yeah, this is Primitivo and IGT from Puglia. So it's not Primitivo di Manduria. So it's from the larger area right just outside, but it's still from the heel of the boot. 
So this is like the hottest part of, of Italy, really. Uh, to 2018. Yeah. So great, you picked one to three years, so it's three years old, yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, if you have some water, just rinse before we get to wine number four. All right. Three or four? Oh, three. Sorry. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, oh. Um, sorry. Yes. Clarity, I would say clear. Um, brightness. Let me just see something here. This could be always, could, could be a little hazy. Do you, do you guys clear to hazy? Okay, I'm just clear to hazy. Yeah, that's what I'm seeing here. Maybe a little more hazy than fully clear. I'm saying bright. Yep. Looking right through mm -hmm. intensity, almost like a pale medium. Yeah, and look how you can see your fingers through it. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Primary color, I would say, um, I would say like a very light ruby. It's a ruby for sure. This is, this is a light, yeah. Um, Anything else you see in there color wise? Is that the only one? Orange. Yes, I was perfect. Say for the second color. Great, orange. great pickup here, yeah. This is starts ruby in the center, and then as you go towards the edge, it'll come, it'll pick up some, you know, orange. Um, rhythm variation, I have a little. Almost like a clear ring around. Yeah. Um, gas evidence, none. Nope. Sediment, none. Yep. Yeah. Um, viscosity. Um, I see a lot of movement in there. So, what do you say? How's the viscosity? Um, I would say medium plus. Yeah, or, but not more. I mean, if, I would write like between medium and medium plus. That's what I would call it, but you know. And then extraction. Not more than medium in this no, one. No, it's relatively. It's so yeah. Okay, awesome. Uh, Paula. No. No. Okay, we got. Three. Absolutely. Um, intensity. I, I just got a bug in here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That was interesting. Um, they love that wine. They do. Uh, I would say medium yep. intensity. Mm -hmm. um, aromics, very aromatics. I would say maybe uh, ripe. Um, I would say maybe red and black fruit. And you're picking up on um, maybe plum, blackberry. Right. Okay, and what in red fruit? What are you guys getting here? Strawberry, yeah, absolutely. Right. Like that. Remember that, like wild strawberry that we saw. That this is what comes to mind here. Like these, like little cherry, cherry also. Yeah. Listen, uh, I I think I told you that before. I get almost every red wine. If you want to just add one thing, cherry, it's always going to be in it. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I would say yeah. This. Also, again, like we sometimes I associate so much with color. I know I'm probably the, one of the instructors that does most so. 
but it points me that way. This look at the color of the wine. Look at the colors of the fruit that you're getting. This is red cherry more. You get your, your wild strawberry. There is a hint of plum here for sure. Could be a red plum. Uh, I think too ripe though, is it? No, but some of it is even a little underripe. Yeah, yeah ripe and under. Like as Dylan explained to you guys, you can. This can happen. Both can be detected. Yeah, detected. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. I'm not picking up on. It's anything else, but it's subdued. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's again. It's like one of those wines that is like elegant but holds back a little, almost out of politeness. It feels like. Yeah. Licorice, there you go. Yeah. Some black pepper. There's definitely like when you think about the more you think about now that we're past the red fruit that we get here, and you get more again, like this, and your dried herbs, your that herbaceous in the licorice. Uh you get some chocolate? chalkiness. Chalkiness, yes. Okay, um, is that it? Any, so then in terms of secondary aromatics. Don't get any yeast. No. On the aging, this is where I'm having a problem yeah. with the Europeans, okay? Because they will age for like four months in an old in an yeah. barrel and then and you don't 18 smell it. months in a stainless steel. Yeah, you and don't smell so, it. Yeah, you don't smell it. And you know what? Then you put that down. Okay. You don't smell it. Oftentimes, what's the like when you age a wine? And here, I mean, I do get some, some of this like. I mean, I get a hint. You get a hint, of, a, a hint of wood, but it's very faint, and it's new to. So if you get it, if you don't, you just write that. You can't write anything down that you don't smell. Okay, it's nonsense. You still have your palate. You're still going to be tasting it, and a lot of times with these Italian wines. The oak age is really just for the uh, texturally, or you know, to really help these wines evolve faster, but not impart flavor onto them. Mm -hmm. That happens a lot more with traditional Spanish wines with American oak, or some French wines where they use new French oak barrels, or in particular, New World wines, the United States. Uh, uh, any of the new world countries where you have more of a heavy oak use to give you know uh, these oak aromas off, but it, that's not in here okay cool great don't smell it don't put it down perfect um development developing, developing yeah. yeah all right um because mature you would get what yeah well it gets more mature then you get more of those like earthy qualities like mushroomy and stuff and when it gets over the hill vinegary that kind of stuff just as a reminder okay palette we're going to Ray. yes uh, fruit condition uh, uh, some yeah uh, red black fruits mm. I was just um, blown away by this wine. I'm sorry. I had to uh, pause for a second. Great. So you gave us um, this is clean. Uh, oh, uh, no, we're doing primary flavors first. Ripe and perhaps some underripe. Is that what you had? Yeah, right. Okay, cool. Yeah. Then uh, fruit. Red black. Red black. Okay. Uh, can you be a little more specific? Is is this this wine uh, confirm what we smelled? Mm -hmm. A lot of it. Yes. We get the red fruit. We get the little strawberries. We get the black um, black cherry for sure. Yeah, which is also great. Tomato leaf. Yeah. Um, dried herbs. Dried herbs. Yep. Double 
Who wants to taste the delicious? Does anybody else taste the delicious? Not so. I don't. Not so much. I mean, we're going to be tasting next week with Sangiovese, where you get that a lot more. I not so much here. Um, I'm not really cool with the minerality. Have you? Are we? Did we physically taste it? Play it live somewhere? Uh, no. So minerality is uh, as somebody. Uh, when this term first appeared, there were articles written on like you cannot measure it, so hence it doesn't exist. That's what some people were claiming. That is nonsense. Yes, you can. It's certainly an absence of fruit. When you don't taste fruit, what else do you taste? Sometimes you can get like this like stoniness, gravelly, wet stone. Then we talked about this, like when we had this class, and I, I told you, I walked, I got off the subway here, Columbus Circle, there's a fountain. It hits that water. It was still pretty hot when we started the class here. You could smell this in the air. You could taste this too. Um, so this is uh, grown on volcanic soil. So some of the, what I mean, it's like this irony, minerality. So I get that. But um, focus on these things. It's, it's hard when you, when you completely when you have no idea what you're talking about. Maybe it helps to put some rocks in a glass and swirl it and taste it. Really, literally. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I've how else have we learned? You know, yeah. unless you eat a banana, you'll never know what a banana tastes like. You know, uh, maybe even is that hint of like smoke or. Mm -hmm. Somebody said like sm smoked meats or something, because that's also very volcanic. Mm -hmm. Black pepper. Black pepper for yeah. sure, yeah. So, I mean, this is the thing, like, can you see like similarities how this wine is similar to a Syrah from the Northern Road? It's yet, it's both elegant, yet has so... It's, I know it's stupid, but that's the old, the wine world calls these wines so like masculine with like this like leather and pepper. Um, but yet there's an elegance about it. And that is, I tell you, that's the reason why Mount Etna is so sought after now, because that's what you can get there. You can get this particular elegance here, where you can describe all these different things that we just tasted. You know, 10, 12, easily. Mm. But Ray, continue. What else do we... Um... Well, there will be malolactic fermentation again because it's a red wine, but you don't taste it. So um, you don't taste butter, cream, or cheese. No. no. Okay, that's great. Aging... Listen, there are, uh, you know, texturally, those tannins that you feel that dry out your mouth right now yep. could be coming both from a, the grape itself, or they could be coming from a little bit of, that's the only way you would get neutral oak. It's that it, you know, has that a little bit, but it doesn't taste like American oak or French oak, does it now? It doesn't. Yeah. So if there is any, if anybody detects like it texturally, and it has a little more texture than what you maybe expect this wine otherwise to be, you would say, yeah, it was probably like partially aged in neutral oak. But if you don't know, it's totally, because it doesn't taste like it, to write down, I don't detect any oak. This could be, again, because it's a red wine and it, you know, in, in red wine, when you when you ferment, when you age it in concrete, what's the difference between concrete and stainless steel? Stainless steel is impenetrable, right? By air, it's it's uh, it's so uh, sterile in a way. You know that a lot of and you know Cheryl, you know that because you work with natural winemakers. It's always like their biggest complaint about it. it's like they're too clean. And they stop living for that time that they age, whereas concrete allows a tiny little exchange 
and doesn't impart anything. And especially in this part of the world of Italy, you'll see a lot of concrete vats. So that would be just how that wine tastes, a good bet, whether it happened or not, but it's still a good assumption. When you okay. say exchange, exchange, like minerality? No, no, not, not minerality air. from it, that the, the air. So the that air, okay. the tannins in that wine can come around and this wine can age faster to, you know, and still live. Okay, cool. Uh, how is, what's the development? Developing. Developing, yeah. This is not mature. This does not have like these like uh, bruised fruits yet. It still is, it's very vibrant as a wine, uh, but drinkable. So that's the perfect uh, uh, explanation for, or a description for developing. Okay, cool. Structure. Um, Bellamy. Um, medium intensity. Mm -hmm. Dry. Yep. Medium to medium plus acidity. Yeah, perfect. Um, medium to medium plus tannins and chalky. It's, yeah, um, I would personally go with medium tannins, but if you say medium, medium plus, that's, that's fine. But I would personally go with medium <clears throat> and what the texture of the tannins are. They're, 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 not com they're not completely chalky, there may be a hint, but I think it's pretty uh, relatively round for, so it's, it's, you know what, we had that wine before, kind of in between. That makes sense to you if you all get that this way. Okay. Uh, body. Medium body. Yeah, definitely. It's not medium plus. This is a medium body. Yeah. Uh, medium alcohol. I would say so too. Exactly. Uh, complexity, I would say medium, medium plus. Yeah, it's got more than medium in my book. It's got a medium plus, if not high. Again, remember all the things that we said about this wine and that it's not just, if you compare this perfect example <clears throat> to the Primitivo we had before, and that was really just a lot of fruit. And once that fruit was gone, it wasn't that pleasant in your mouth. And now you have this, this is elegance and it's so balanced. To me, that has a little more than, uh, but, but again, I, I, I am, that's why I'm telling you these things. I drink these wines a lot. And this is why we say that these wines will have a little more because you can talk about them longer. And just the fact that they don't punch you in the face doesn't mean that they don't have anything to say. They just say it quietly. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's why for me, the complexity is more medium plus Balanced. Uh, okay. Impression. Well, we all know it's old world, but it tastes like old world, right? Yeah. Because again, higher acidity, lower alcohol, lower body, uh, not as fruit forward, not as jammy. So this all puts us into the old world. Climate. Well, we said, look, go back to what we said about medium body, medium alcohol, medium plus acidity. That's not a hot climate. That's a warm climate for a red wine like that. And why is it warm if it's from Sicily? Because exactly, Logan, elevation. Because it's from Mount Etna, it's grown up in high elevation. That's why. Okay, then, uh, Teresa, just real quick, impression? Oh, we have, okay, sorry, 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 sorry. You already started there. Warm quality. Yeah, very good. Age range, how, how old is that wine? When was it made? I would say one to three as well. And readiness? I agree, yeah, it still has, it has, this wine will have some life five years probably, mm -hmm. but you can absolutely drink it now. 
Okay, what we were drinking is, of course, a DOC Etna Russell. Uh, it was made in 2017, so it's four years old. Alcohol is 13.5. And this is the traditional 80% Nerello Bascalese, 20% Nerello Capuccio. Okay. Last one. Let's do this. Um, get going here. Can this wine, for, to me, let me just do this part here. This wine to me is, uh, it's, it, it's a little hazy, um, which can, you know, that's the kind of stuff that can give away age a little bit because tannins fall out and they create this like textural thing in there. So to me, this is a little hazy uh, brightness. It's still bright intensity. Uh, I would say medium colors. This is a either like a light garnet in the middle going to a darker ruby to uh, a burnt orange on the rim. There is rim variation. I can see it clearly, that orangey rim, which indicates what in red wine? Little boy age, yeah, exactly, perfect, great. Um, no gas evidence, no sediments. The viscosity is medium to medium, medium plus perhaps, and also the extract, because that's what I say, haziness, like it looks like it just, there's a lot more in there. So medium plus as well. Okay, on the nose, clean intensity. This wine comes at you a little more strong than the last one, right? This comes right, so medium plus here is that intensity. Uh, great, I love it that you guys you're getting that particular part. Fruit condition. This is this is ripe fruit here. There is no underripe in this at all. If maybe a hint of overripe but i for me it's mostly ripe this is like right down the middle great you know okay then sherry <laughs> of course there's a lot of there's a lot of like i think big yeah sweet sherry notes Great, so there is definitely an earthy quality. And if we, um, you know, if we already suspected this wine to have some age and you smell mushrooms, you actually, you really win here because that's what's gonna happen, right? Yeah. What else are we getting here on this? Let me just go back. You get meats, right? Yeah. Can you imagine how good that we would, you know, eat salami with this right now? <laughs> so yeah, you get some meats, some fennel. Mm -hmm. fennel. There's a lot. The more you sniff it, the more yeah. it's going on there. And you know, there is this. Yeah. Salami. yeah. <laughs> great, great call. Um, what about what else do we have here? Boop, 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 boop. Uh, herbaceousness. Is this high alcohol? I'm getting like a almost like burn and light up. Yeah. yeah, well, there is definitely uh, there's definitely something going on there alcohol wise. It's not low, yeah. It's probably as like when we taste it, yeah, it goes like right up here. Um, there's some there's a floralness also. Current, great. I get tobacco again. Do you guys get that? That, that sweet tobacco? 
wow, that's, but like I said, this is like, I get, yeah, I compare this to the Primitivo where we just had black and red fruits too, you know. Yeah, I know, but I'm not saying you don't like it. It's just, how, you know, you get, there's so much more different things it's going on. That's all, that's all I'm saying. It's not, you know, about. Okay, great. Yeah, a little spice. Yeah, no, the more you get it, you get a little more, you know, like, you know, certainly black pepper. Okay, cool. Shall we taste it? We get the ripe fruit again. Um, partly, I get a little bit of dried fruit as well. Um, the fruit is confirmed here again, like, you know, black and red fruit, as in black cherries. The current. Uh, as in red fruit, tobacco, again, that comes right back at you, leather, tomato leaf, also great. Um, I have a tart that hates me too. Tartness? Yeah. Yeah. It's got everything. It's got, it's got acidity for this. This is a red wine that has a lot going on and it's still smacks your lips. So that for a red wine is like, in white wine, it's sometimes easier to detect acidity, but this is a red wine that has medium plus acid. It ha this wine has structure, right? You can feel it everywhere mm -hmm. and it lingers. So we go down that list. Um, well, what about oak aging here? It seems likely. Yeah. I taste texturally, I would bet this was a aged in oak and a neutral oak. Again, Slavonian, neutral oak. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that points me to it is, of course, because I know a thing or two about the grape, Alianico. That's a high tannin grape. That comes off really aggressive. So you need to age these wines and often in oak to make them more palatable quicker. Okay, so I would guess this is aged in concrete, in what did I say, in neutral oak um, and developing. Oh, the, what's the development here? I mean, to me, it tastes like a mature wine. That's a wine that's really good now. It's super pleasant, it's super elegant compared to the wine we had before that tasted a little younger. So, you know, I, in terms of mature meaning, this is a great wine that has some age that I want to drink right now. That to me is mature here. And we get some of these like earthy, like the mushroom meanness, Laura, that you described. Yeah. What would, what would the bitterness? Okay, what bitterness? Yeah, uh, we, you get a lot of that in Italian red wines. Mm. Uh, you know, what we described before, that bitterness finish, even the Primitivo had that. Mm -hmm. The white wine had that. It's like the grape varieties that grow there that have that characteristic. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're, get, we're getting there now. Structure, clean, intensity, medium plus. Sweetness, dry, right? There's no disagreement here. I mean, intensity could be medium plus or high. Acidity, medium plus. Tannins, they quantitatively medium plus to high. Quantitatively, qualitatively, they're around now. When would you describe fine grain? I feel like we haven't had that yet. Would that be like, you could kind of almost, it's like granular? 
Yeah, fine grain. I'm not a big fan. I like the, you know, at the top there, um, really like velvety, because we're going to get to that when we go to like Alpine red wines okay. and like cooler climate, like Austrian red wines, where the tannins are definitely there, but they're really smooth and silky. Yeah. Um, so um, that might be, that. that is to me what, uh, Dylan meant by this term that to, that's how I interpret it because to me the smoothest tannin is that silky tannin yeah. and we're going to get there with wines yeah. we haven't had them yet cool. you know when we had them good it was like this kind of like round but not mm -hmm. super velvety okay cool thanks for that question though uh, body that's a medium plus body and uh, alcohol. So uh, I didn't smell it as I, I mean, it's there, I know, but even when drinking it, there is some. It's a medium plus, probably, yeah. yeah. Complexity. To me, that's a complex wine. It's got so much, and it is so pleasant too. Um, so that's high complexity, very balanced. Finished is, you know, medium plus to long. I can taste this wine for a good twenty seconds. Impression: old world climate, warm plus uh, quality. Very good, if not outstanding. Uh, age range, this is probably five to 10 years old, just based on, you know, we, we looked at the color, we saw how it tastes, how the tannins come around. Uh, and I think I would be, I am actually perfectly happy to drink this right now, or you could put this away, it still has life. This is. is this, ladies and gentlemen, was the Barolo of the South, the so called. <laughs> Taurasi, 100% Alianico. Year was 2013. And alcohol is 14%. Yeah. A great example of the elegance. And I cannot stress this enough. And then I'm going to shut up and close this down because I went way over time. Uh, I cannot stress enough how difficult it is sometimes in these like hotter climates to make wines with this elegance. If you did those last two wines that we tasted, had that, and they come from places like Sicily and Campania, that's why these areas are considered the great areas of great production and winemaking in Southern Italy. Thank you for staying longer and for, uh, you know, <laughs> suffering through this. Uh, next week, it's going to be Central Italy. I'll post all this stuff and um, wish you a buona notte. Can I request something? Hold on, yeah. Can we um, get um, the material for next week by tomorrow? Because some of us are busy on